Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 14th of November. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. Dozens of Palestinians calling for the liberation of Jerusalem used ladders and makeshift bridges to breach the security barrier near the Kalandia checkpoint on the outskirts of the capital today. Border police were able to disperse the protesters, and they returned to Palestinian-controlled territory. A road near the Hizmid Junction was also closed briefly when security forces used non-lethal weapons after dozens of other Palestinians threw rocks. Friday Muslim prayers in the Old City passed with relative calm after the government lifted all age restrictions on male worshippers praying at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. An estimated 40,000 people today ascended the Temple Mount for prayers, where heavy police forces were deployed to prevent the outbreak of any unrest, which has plagued the capital for the past months. There were continued demonstrations elsewhere in the country by Israeli Arabs over last week's killing of Kheridin Hamdan by police. In Umul Fahem, about 1,500 protesters, including Arab members of Knesset, gathered, while Minister of Public Security Tzhak Aronovich visited Kfar Khanna, where Hamdan was fatally shot after he attacked police with a knife. Aronovich urged local leaders to calm residents and prevent further clashes. Today was the first time in months that all restrictions were removed on Muslim worship in the Old City and comes after Israel and the Palestinians pledged to take concrete steps to calm tensions around Jerusalem's holiest site, according to an agreement reached in Jordan. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was unexpectedly invited to Amman yesterday, where he joined U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Jordan's King Abdullah for a nearly three-hour meeting last night. After the talks, Kerry said that all parties agreed to specific and practical actions that both sides can take to restore calm. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas did not attend the trilateral meeting in what is perceived as a sign of deep distrust of Netanyahu. Earlier in the day, Abbas met with Kerry, who said that it is just not the right moment for the two sides to really come together yet. Kerry went on to say that Abbas and Netanyahu need to recognize that the situation has changed before any such meeting can take place. Jordanian Foreign Minister Nasser Judah said that Netanyahu has demonstrated commitment to maintaining the status quo at the Temple Mount and is respecting the Jordanian monarchy's custodianship of holy sites. President Abbas strongly restated his firm commitment to nonviolence, and he made it clear that uh, he will do everything possible to restore calm and to prevent the incitement of violence and to try to change the climate. Prime Minister Netanyahu strongly reaffirmed Israel's commitment to uphold the status quo on the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount and to implement these steps. And King Abdullah also agreed to continue to take affirmative steps to restore calm and implement practical measures to prevent further escalation of tensions. The tension in Jerusalem as you have seen in the last few days, has um, sparked tension, not just in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, but elsewhere um, in the West Bank. And uh, this is something that uh, concerns us all. The relative calm in the old city today came despite calls from Hamas in Gaza, threatening that Israeli actions in Jerusalem could spark a new explosion in the region. A spokesman for the terror group's armed wing made his first appearance since the end of the summer conflict to accuse the Israeli government of assaulting the Al-Aqsa Mosque. While speaking at a rally of several thousand people, including Hamas gunmen in Rafah last night, Abu Aida blamed also blamed Israel for preventing reconstruction efforts in the Gaza Strip. Temple Mount activist Yuda Glick posed for his first photo since he was shot point blank by a would-be assassin October 29th. Seen here with his wife Yafi at Jerusalem Sheret Tzedek Hospital, Glick's condition is continuing to improve, according to his wife, who says that they are experiencing miracles every day and see before their very eyes how the prayers and powers from the entire nation of Israel are reaching them. She also expressed her own deep thanks as well as those of her husband and the Glick family and asked that people continue to pray for Yehuda Yoshua Ben Ita Brenda, although to refrain from coming to the hospital since the medical staff feel that it's not yet time for visitors. The state controller has entered the feud between IDF Chief of Staff Benny Gantz and the head of the Shin Bet Yoram Cohen over disputed advance warnings of the summer war with Hamas. Yosef Shapiro will examine the collection and sharing of intelligence between the General Security Service and the Army as part of his overall probe of the 50-day Operation Protective Edge. 
The Comptroller will also assess the government's decision-making process, which may have been impacted by incomplete reports. In a posting on his Facebook page today, former Shinbet director Yuval Diskin wrote that the discord between the Gan, Gans and Cohen is childish, going on to caution that the friction is likely to trickle down to commanders and agents in the field and harm cooperation. He also accused the IDF chief of behaving in a patronizing and hypocritical manner by publicly protesting the claims from the top Shinbet officials. A court in Lima has ordered the detention of a Lebanese citizen for 18 months while authorities investigate allegations that he planned to attack the Israeli embassy and other Jewish targets in Peru. Mohammed Ghaleb Hamdar was arrested last month on charges of terrorism and forgery and admitted to being a member of the Lebanon-based Hezbollah terror organization after interrogation, although he initially provided false documentation to police, maintaining that he was from Sierra Leone during a police raid of his apartment in the Peruvian capital. Investigators say that detonators, gunpowder, and other material necessary for the production of explosives were discovered during the search of his, his residence, which was located in close proximity to the Israeli embassy. Hamdar is denying all of the charges against him. Meanwhile, a French court has, for the first time, sentenced one of its own citizens to prison for having joined an Islamist group fighting in Syria. Flavien Moreau will spend seven years behind bars after being convicted on a terrorism offense after he returned home from what he claimed was a 10-day stint in Syria with an unnamed group. Court documents identify the 27-year-old as a determined militant who told his parents that he had no problem dying for Islam and made several failed attempts to reach Syria before finally succeeding in 2012. The case will likely serve as a benchmark for dozens of other volunteer jihadis who are being held pending trial. French authorities believe that 118 of the estimated 1,000 citizens who left to fight in the Middle East have now returned to French soil. The country is taking a tough stance against those believed to be linked to terror groups, particularly in the aftermath of the murders of three people at the Jewish Museum of Belgium earlier this year by Frenchman Mehdi Namouche, who also fought with extremist groups in Syria. And the United Kingdom is also taking more extreme measures against foreign fighters returning from Iraq and Syria. During an address to Australia's parliament, Prime Minister David Cameron announced plans to introduce new counterterrorism measures in the near future that could prevent British citizens from traveling abroad or returning home after engaging in jihadi battle abroad and grant authorities power to seize the suspects' passports if they refuse to cooperate with screening policies. The proposed legislation would also ban the landing of any airlines on British territory if they fail to comply with the UK's no-fly lists and security criteria. Cameron also appealed for the support of the British Muslim community in eradicating homegrown terrorism. We must ban extremist preachers from our countries. We must root out extremism from our schools, universities and prisons. As we do so, we must work with the overwhelming majority of Muslims who abhor the twisted narrative that has seduced some of our people. We must continue to celebrate Islam as a great world religion of peace. Turning to international negotiations to reach a nuclear accord with Iran, and French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius said that he is prepared to go to Vienna for an extended period if necessary to reach agreement by the impending deadline. He made the announcement in Paris while standing alongside his Italian counterpart, Paolo Gentiloni. The final phase of the talks will open in Austria in four days' time between representatives from Iran and France, the United States, China, Britain, Germany and Russia. Speaking from Moscow, a spokesman for Russia's foreign ministry acknowledged that the deal may not be secured before time runs out on the November 24th target date, which was already extended by four months last July. Alexander Lukashevich went on to question whether the deadline itself exceeds the importance of achieving a real deal and stressed that more time may be needed to reach mutually acceptable compromises. The sought-after long-term agreement is aimed at assuring the six world powers that Iran's nuclear development program will not be used for military purposes in exchange for the easing of sanctions against the Islamic Republic. Russia maintains closer ties with Iran than the other participants at the talks and even built Iran's Boucher nuclear facility on the coast of the Persian Gulf. 
Here at home in criminal matters, and the Tel Aviv District Court has sentenced convicted killer Ali Fahima to serve two consecutive terms of life imprisonment. Fahima was found guilty of murdering Beatrice Rud Rodov and her daughter Denise back in 2009. In attempts to avoid being caught after the murders, Fahima dismembered both bodies and dumped parts at various locations, including Beatrice Rodov's headless corpse in a dumpster not far from her Ramat Gan home. The state argued that Fahima also cleaned the Rodov apartment, disposed of blood-stained furniture, and then cashed a forged check for 10,000 shekels from the victim's account. Given the recent wave of violence here in the country, CNN's Nina Dos Santos asked Minister of Tourism, Ozi Landau, how the current situation is affecting travelers' desires to come to visit the Holy Land. It's exactly those kind of uh, reporting on... Uh... Uh, international TV that make people feel as if Israel is unsafe. This is not the case. Israel is highly safe. It's a place where women uh, and parents send their kids to school, unescorted kids. That's the place. Uh, and what I do wish to do, first of all here, is to extend an invitation to people of all uh, countries of uh, a background of democracy and freedom to come to Israel and see for their own eyes the true narrative, not what we just see over there, of a country where the values of our Judeo-Christian civilization just began. That's where it all began. And even today in Jerusalem, despite of what we saw here, this is true mostly to the Arab highly populated areas because of incitement, which is promoted by uh, Mr. Abu Mazen. The, uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority, that's the thing. Irrespective of the politics, irrespective of whether it's a question of fact or perception, the reality is, is that the Israeli tourism industry is worth around about $11 billion every single year. You have a brief that represents 4.5% of your country's GDP. And if people are being put off going there because they're asking themselves whether it's safe, they might be interested in viewing the beautiful historical sites of Jerusalem, but they are concerned. That is a lot at stake, isn't it? Yeah, I fully understand the concern of people. In fact, if people were not uh, concerned, we would have two or three or four times more tourists because Israel is something which is not only 10 months a year sunny. We have beaches. We have this, I would say, combination of cultural and city break, a, a type of, of sites of richness with just in uh, Jerusalem. Let me ask you this. Have you noticed that the tourism industry has been significantly materially affected by the conflict with Gaza? Definitely. How, to what extent has it been affected? Well, Can you we've, give us lost, idea? we've lost about 20% of our tourism just because of what happened in Gaza. But that's not an isolated event. We are in the Middle East. And over the past uh, 10 years, 15 years, despite of all of the different conflicts we used to have, Tourism is on a constant increase because, and this is very interesting, as a common denominator to all of the tourists who came to Israel the first time, what really strikes them as they finish their visit is this touch of surprise. They saw a totally different Israel than what they could uh, have imagined before, just from what TV is reporting as to what's happening in Israel. Well, obviously, if you are reporting all the time about stone throwing, uh, and Molotov cocktails uh, in some streets in Jerusalem, you get the feeling that Israel is a battleground. It is not. It is a place where people love to be, of course, Israelis, but our, our visitors who come from abroad, it's a friendly place. It's an open place. It's a place where it is the safest, not just for Jews and Christians, but for Arabs in the Middle East. The relationship between the United States and Israel is stronger than ever. That's the message from Israeli basketball legend Tal Brody while speaking to Arod Sheva from Washington, D.C. after attending this week's General Assembly of the Jewish Federations of North America as a representative of the Israeli Jewish Congress. If you read the papers, you think that our relationship with the United States is terrible. But in fact, it's uh, stronger than it's been ever been. I think uh, Joe Biden mentioned it in his speech that one-fifth of the military budget within the last seven years is coming from the American government and also about the hundred million dollars that went in for the Kippat Barzell, for the Iron Dome. So 
in, in actually in foil, in uh, reality, the American government is solidly behind Israel, and I was va very happy to hear it from here. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, you, not everything you read in the paper has to be true. And from what you're seeing when it comes to the citizens, even more support, more solidarity with Israel. I think also in every poll that was taken in America, I think you have over 60 percent, uh, close to even to maybe a little bit even more, that the American community is uh, behind Israel. Uh, whether it's saying that, uh, you know, the uh, gossip about uh, Netanyahu and uh, uh, President Obama, uh, and every family, uh, as Joe Biden said, they have arguments, you have difference of opinion. But in fact, you have to look at, in fact, what is the relationship between America and the United States, and nothing has changed. And uh, as he said, it even has gotten stronger, and they know exactly uh, what not to do and not to have a bad deal with the Iran. They know it's very important for Israel, it's very important for the Middle East, not only for Israel. And it's important for the United States. So I think that uh, the feeling here, I think uh, after the vice president spoke, uh, it's, it's a better feeling than when I came here. The gag order has been lifted on the name of the suspect arrested for the rape and murder of Noah Eyal back in 1998. Daniel Nachmani has been charged with committing the crime by the Jerusalem District Court and remanded to police custody until the end of the proceedings against him. It has been revealed that he was arrested last month after a stunning breakthrough. DNA analysis of one of Nachmani's relatives arrested for an unrelated offense was linked to the AL case, prompting detectives to reopen the investigation, which eventually focused on Nachmani. While he was under surveillance, he spit on a sidewalk, and analysis of that sample reportedly matches evidence from the crime scene. The 17-year-old victim went missing from the center of town 16 years ago and was last seen near Davidka Square entering a white car believed to be a Ford Escort. Her body was discovered the following day in a forest in the remote neighborhood. Nachmani is now a 38-year-old married father of two and denying all of the allegations. This is a sabbatical year on the Hebrew calendar during which Jewish farmers are commanded by the Bible to allow their land to rest. Crops are not to be cultivated and no profit should be made from anything that might grow, although there are ways around the commandment. IBA's own farmer, IBA Arie O'Sullivan, brings us more. The farmlands of Israel are sitting fallow, unplowed and without irrigation. They are resting, as the Lord commanded. The sabbatical year, or Shemitah, comes around every seven years, and most Jewish farmers make arrangements for it. The majority simply sell the land symbolically to a Gentile, and then technically let them sell the produce. But about one in ten abandon farms altogether. Yehuda Gabai says, as a man of faith, he just lets his land sit. I believe that in the other years I will make a good living, he says, so if for one year my income is not good, it's not a big deal. But some farmers are turning to science to find a loophole in the halachic rulings. Gilad Fine from the Moshav B'nai Nitzarim near the arid Egyptian Gazan border grows organic romaine lettuce and kale. Every seven years we have a command in the, in the Bible, in the Tanakh, that we have to let the land rest and we're not meant to work the land. We're meant to study uh, this year Torah and, uh, and our farm is meant to be open for who, who wants to, who would like to come and eat, can eat the, the, the profit, the, what the farm has to offer. He uses hydroponics and grows his plants in troughs, thus lifting them off the Holy Land. This solves the problem for the Shemitah. What we have, the, the plant is in a closed tunnel. The root system is not close to the land. It's above the land. If you can see also, we have a nylon on the, so we won't see the land. And it's above the land. And there's no, there's no uh, 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 relationship here between the land and the root. So we don't have, we're not, we're not uh, uh, using the land just in this year. So then we keep in the Shemitah in a certain wa way, by not uh, using the land. Technically he's right, but most of our Jews don't accept these loopholes. As a pious Jew himself, Fine knows that perhaps the biblical rules don't fully apply to him. Since technically Shemitah, or sabbatical decrees, are only in effect in the land that was under Jewish control 2,000 years ago, his farm near the Gaza Strip is technically outside of these borders. But for the most part, the sabbatical rules written thousands of years ago still apply across the Holy Land. Ariel O'Sullivan for IBA News.
Turning to sports now, and after a week of embarrassing losses, including a EuroLeague home defeat last Thursday at the hands of previously winless Zagreb, Maccabi Tel Aviv got back on track last night in a hard-fought 70-66 thriller over Malaga in Spain. Maccabi opened up an early 10-point lead and held on for the victory as the Spaniards clawed back. Tel Aviv improves to 3-2 in the EuroLeague's Group B, the same record as Malaga. Maccabi's Devin Smith topped all scorers with 24 points and 10 rebounds. In local finance, the shekel today put in a mixed performance in foreign currency trading. And due to the closure of the stock market on Fridays, here's a look at the closing numbers for the week. The IVA weather team says that we can expect a drop in temperatures tomorrow with partly cloudy skies and the possibility of local rain showers in the north and coastal regions by afternoon, spreading throughout the country later at night. Here's the forecast at home and abroad for the next 24 hours. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope to see you again tomorrow at 4 p.m. when I'll be back to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a wonderful evening and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem.